Welcome to Christ Community Church Online. It's a delight to be with you today and to worship the risen Lord Jesus Christ. Today, we're going to be remembering Jesus Christ, what He's done for us on the cross of Calvary through communion. The bread and the cup, they represent His body and His shed blood. So I trust that you're going to prepare yourself. At the conclusion of this service, we'll have communion together. We have been praying for our missionaries around the world as represented by these flags behind me. And we've been asking that God would bless them and provide for them. And we're so grateful for your continued support. We've also been praying that the governors would open up our communities, our economy would be opened up, our churches would be opened up, and we could come back together and worship corporately as a church. So I want you to keep praying for Christ's community church, praying for our community, and asking God to do a miracle here in the land and to heal the land. Today we're going to sing together and worship the Lord and lift high His name. But first, let's pray and ask the Lord to bless our time together. Father, we bless you and we thank you for all that you do in our life. You're such a good God. You're good all the time. And we pray that as we come into your presence, joyfully singing, lifting up our voices to you, that you would inhabit the praises of we, your people. I pray that as we lift you high, you would meet with us. As we study your word, Father, your truth, your precepts would be known by us. Our lives would be changed. We would be godly men and women who live for you in faith, in courage, in boldness. So Lord, I thank you for your presence today. May it be a powerful time as we meet and fellowship around your word and around your table and remember your death, burial, and resurrection. We pray all these things in faith believing. In Jesus' name, everyone said, amen. Worship with us today. It's a brand new song. It's called We Believe, and I trust that you'll worship and sing together, and you'll lift your voice with me. In this time of desperation, when all we know is doubt and fear, there is only one foundation. We believe. We believe, we believe in God the Father, we believe in Jesus Christ, we believe in the Holy Spirit, and He's given us new life. We believe in the crucifixion, we believe that He conquered death, we believe in the resurrection, and he's coming back again, we believe. So let our faith be more than anthems, greater than the songs we sing. And in our weakness and temptations, we believe.
the Father. We believe in Jesus Christ. We believe in the Holy Spirit. And He's given us new life. We believe in the crucifixion. We believe that He conquered death. We believe in the resurrection. And He's coming back. He's coming. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good. In just a moment, I'm going to be preaching on why do bad things happen to good people. And with me today is my friend Lynn Sexton. Cliff and Lynn serve on our staff. And Lynn, do you know that God causes all things to work together for good? I do indeed. They have in your life, haven't they? Yes. And I want you to share with us today how God has caused things in your life that you thought were, were just so difficult and heartbreaking to work together for good. Would, would you share your sure. story with us? Sure. Well, this story starts back with my folks uh, when I was two years old. Uh, they weren't believers. And uh, my dad was working underground in Hollywood uh, doing cable splicing, and he was not a believer in any way. He was an atheist. And my little brother was born, and he, uh, at the age of 12 days, was very sick. And my dad got the call at work that Timmy needed surgery, and Timmy died in surgery. And my dad didn't know that he had died, and he got in the elevator of the hospital to go up to check on him, and Timmy's little body was being taken downstairs in the elevator at that time. And my dad was brokenhearted and my mom was brokenhearted. And there in the hospital lobby was my, my grandparents, my mom's folks. And they said, if you guys want to see your baby again, you need Jesus. And that's how my folks got saved, right there in the hospital. So fast forward, um, you know, my dad became in the ministry and all that. Um, and Cliff and I had just gotten married in 73. We'd been told we couldn't have kids, but I was pregnant in 74 and lost that, that baby through miscarriage. 74, we, later in the year, we went to Portland so he could go to graduate school, seminary. And um, I became pregnant and was really sick, had to quit work. Felt terrible because I'd gone there to support my husband through seminary and work. So he took a job at night at Napa Auto Parts. And uh, so during the day he went to seminary, at night he was gone. So I was all by myself a lot. And one morning I, I was about 24 weeks pregnant and I woke up in labor. And he scooped me up and took me to the nearest hospital where our daughter was born. And she weighed uh, one pound, 12 ounces. And um, they took us both by ambulance up to the University of Oregon, where there was a NICU unit. And um, this was in 1975. The NICU unit would probably look like an antique today. And some of the methods and medications that they had were discontinued right after this. But um, we called our folks. My dad was in the middle of an ICI conference. So he had all the pastors there praying. But Sarah only lived 36 hours. And um, they had let me go up to the NICU and see her before she died. And they wouldn't let me touch her. I didn't get to hold her. And it was, it was really heartbreaking. And so um, there we were trying to find baby clothes small enough to bury her in. And I was kind of in shock because my mom went out and bought doll clothes. And then we had to pick a casket. And it was all so surreal that I, um, I, was, I was pretty mad at God. Um, I knew better than that. You know, I'd, I'd heard other people talk about being mad at God. But when it's you um, and you can't put two and two together and get four, 
uh, it's, it's pretty rough. So um, we had the funeral. Our friends came uh, from seminary. My folks came up. And um, just as a sidelight, I had never had a pastor before because my dad had always been the pastor. So it was uh, a wonderful experience in that time to have our pastor, Don Baker, um, minister to us. That was kind of a neat lesson for me. And we had, um, we had to just go on. So we had to pay for the funeral. We had to pay for everything. And it was, uh, it was a hard time for us financially, too. But Cliff went back to his routine. And I stayed at home and cried for weeks and uh, got more and more discouraged and depressed and alone. And, uh, you know, in Portland, it rains every day, and that didn't help. <laughs> but um, uh, one day, Cliff had a professor that he didn't even know the man. He doesn't remember the man's name. Call him in at seminary at Western and say um, that his story was that he and his wife had lost 11 babies by miscarriage and that he had heard Cliff's story. And he said, you and your wife really need to get right with God and tell God that this is okay or it's going to follow you all your lives and you'll never get over it. So um, Cliff came home for dinner right before he went to Napa Auto Parts and he said, this is what happened and I want you to think about it. I know it's hard <clears throat> and I was not real happy about hearing that news because I didn't have any other emotional place to put my pain. And um, I would go into the baby's room, you know, at night, and I had made, you know, a hooked rug, and I had made little things for the baby, and it was all just empty and gone. And um, so he left for work, and but not before we both got down on our knees, and we prayed. And it was one of those prayers where God, I, I know I'm not supposed to be mad at you, but right now I am. So help me not be mad at you. And um, then he went to work and. I finally worked it out with God and said, I'm, I'm just trying to be able to breathe and go one hour at a time, not one day at a time, but one hour at a time. And, and the Lord said, you know, that's okay. It's okay for you to be mad at me. I, I'm pretty big. I can take it. And in about an hour, the phone rang, and it was Cliff's sister. Now, we have to back up a little bit. Cliff's sister had been a wild, wild hippie girl. And he had led her to Christ when he was a new believer. And she had taken a, a class at First Baptist under Peter Johansson uh, called Evangelism. And she said to me on the phone, she said, now you knew I took that class with Pete Johansson, and one night he had us open the phone book and take out a page and point to randomly to a name and call that person. And I did that. And I led this girl to the Lord over the phone. She just called me. I've never met her. But she said she just called me from the labor's room, labor room at Doctors Hospital in Modesto. She's having a baby. She can't be a mom. She's 22, but she doesn't feel like she can be a mother. And she wants Christian parents. Would you like to adopt this baby? And I almost fell off my chair. I said, Nancy, you're crazy. Uh, I'm still... I'm still grieving Sarah's loss. Um, so, so no thank you. I appreciate the call, but I, I can't do this. She said, promise me one thing. Promise me you'll pray about it, and you'll tell Cliff. OK, I promise you I'll pray about it, but I'm not interested. So I called Napa Auto Parts, and Cliff came home at midnight. And I told him what happened. He called Nancy. He said, <clears throat> what's going on? And she said, well, she's still in labor. Um, and so, will you pray about it? And so we said, okay, we'll pray about it. And we prayed about it, and God immediately changed my heart. I mean, like light and darkness, just the light came on. So I called my dad, and my dad said, uh, okay, I'm going to get Paul full for my lawyer, and we're going to go to the hospital and interview her and see if this is legit or if there are strings attached or whatever. Now, you have to know, Paul Fulfer's kids were both adopted. My brother and sister were both adopted. So both of these men had uh, a lot of knowledge about adoption. My dad called me back in an hour. She was still in labor. He said, uh, 
this is a this is a deal. This is a done deal. It is for real. She's very serious about it. We prayed with her. We talked to her. She does not want to be a mother. She's not suited to be a mother. She has other things going on in her life that would not be good for a baby. So we'll just wait. So it wasn't until noon the next morning my dad called and said, are you sitting down? I said, okay. I sat down and he said, it's a boy. He weighs 10'5", and they had to go to the janitor's closet to get a yardstick to measure his length. He was 24 and a half inches long. This lady was in labor for a day and a half. And he said, she signed the papers already. Get down here. So we went to the airport. We got on a plane. By that time, it was night the next day. And he, my dad had kept calling me and saying, hey, you got to come down here and hold this baby. And I, I was just, again, in shock. And um, on our way down there, uh, they couldn't get the landing gear down on the plane. And it was nighttime. It was raining in San Francisco. We looked out the window. There were fire engines and emergency vehicles all along the runway. They were, they were foaming the runway because they thought the plane was going to crash land. Um, they had Cliff and some other guys stand at the emergency exits to help people. It was pretty crazy. And at the very last minute, um, the landing gear came down. We, we had a family member pick us up, and we drove home, and we got to hold our baby, Joshua. So um, that, that was a big lesson for me, how, you know, my parents lost a child. My dad um, was able to minister to hundreds of people who lost children. We didn't know at that time, but God was going to call Cliff into that kind of ministry. And he's had almost 2,000 funerals, and um, some of those have been for people who lost children. So I don't think, I don't believe that God caused any of this. But God used it to his glory. And um, our son Joshua is now a dad of two kids. He's a great husband. He loves Jesus. He's made us proud. And um, we, we, had, we have another son. Um, we, we say we have one, um, one of each. And his name is Caleb. So my dad always called them the two spies. So that's... Um, the beginning of the story, really, we don't know how it's going to end, but we know it'll be for the glory of God. Wow. Lynn, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for telling that story. And we're going to see in just a moment from Scripture, from God's Word, how God causes all things to work together for good. You may be going through a crisis right now. God's going to speak to you today through His Word. You're going to see how God allows good people to suffer, but he causes all things to work together for good. Those who love him, those who are the called according to his purposes. I trust your heart will be encouraged by today's message. Take your Bibles, turn to the Gospel of Luke, Luke chapter 13. And let me ask you a question. Have you ever wondered why God allows people to suffer? Why God allows bad things to happen to good people? And we begin to realize, and we're going to see it in this passage of Scripture, that we live in a fallen world. We live in a world that's filled with sin. And the Bible says that in this flesh dwells no good thing. Now it's our spirit, our soul that is saved, but our spirit still wars against our flesh. And then you have unredeemed people who live with evil intent and corruption abounds all through our culture. And we begin to realize why good people suffer and experience hardship. In 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 46, God says, There is no man who does not sin. Even as followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, we have to come up against our flesh, which desires to sin. We have to choose to live 
as a new creation in Christ. The real question that I want you to ask yourself as we get ready to read Luke chapter 13 is why do good things happen to bad people? And in this fallen world that we live, it's amazing all the good things that we get to experience. I want you to see how Jesus responds. He actually will ask questions to the questions. Follow along as I read in Luke chapter 13, beginning in verse 1. Now, on the same occasion, there were some present who reported to him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And Jesus had answered and said unto them, Do you suppose that these Galileans were greater sinners than all other Galileans because they suffered this fate? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Verse 4. Or do you suppose that those 18 on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them were worse culprits than all the men who lived in Jerusalem? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you will likewise perish. And Jesus began telling this parable. A certain man had a fig tree which had been planted in his vineyard. And he came looking for fruit on it and did not find any. And he said to the vineyard keeper, Behold, for three years I have come looking for fruit on this fig tree. Without finding any, cut it down. Why does it even use up the ground? And he answered and said unto him, Let it alone, sir, for this year too I will dig around it and put in fertilizer. And if it bears fruit, next year, fine. But if not, cut it down. And may God add his blessing to the public reading of His Word. Now, the very first biblical truth is what are my options? And believe it or not, Jesus gives options in this passage of Scripture. Now, why does God allow good people to suffer? And the short answer to that question is because of the wickedness that is all around us, the evil men and women in this fallen culture is the reason. There are human consequences to every choice. And believe it or not, many times the consequences that we reap are from choices all around us. Jesus is fully aware of the violence and the murder of every culture. Pilate had murdered some of the Jewish people from Galilee And as they were offering sacrifices to demonic deities, they were mingling blood. Believers today are martyred for their bold proclamation of the gospel. Voice of the Martyrs is a publication that you can read that chronicles believers in many countries of the world that are are tortured for Christ that are martyred for Jesus. Jesus does not want His followers, His genuine followers, to fear evil. 2 Timothy 1.7 says, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. We are not to live fearing the evil around us. We're only to fear God or to reverence God. And in verse 2, Jesus does not use calamity to single out wicked people for punishment. Oftentimes, it's simply the consequences of choices. The real issue in this passage, I believe, is not why do bad things happen to good people. It is why do good things happen to bad people. Jesus asked, were they not all sinners? Do you suppose that these Galileans were greater sinners? 
This is really one of the key thoughts to this passage. It's central to Jesus' teaching in this passage of Scripture. Jesus, our Savior, is deeply moved by the hardness of men and women and the evil acts that they commit. The heart of every individual is deeply flawed. That's why the great Apostle Paul would say, in this flesh dwells no good thing. When you get saved, when you are redeemed by the blood of the Lamb and you choose to follow Christ, it changes the way you think and the way you act. And you become a different, a changed person as a result of it. We all recognize that without Christ in our life, we would be different. Jesus willingly went to the cross and paid the penalty for our sins in full when he died on the cross so that we would not have to. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 1, John writes, My little children, notice family, it's a reference to being a part of God's family. My little children, I am writing these things to you that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And He Himself is the propitiation for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for those of the whole world. Even though we receive Christ by faith, we still have a sin nature. Our flesh, which wars with our spirit, still desires to sin at times. And we do not yield to our fleshly desires. We choose to do what is right. So in verse 3, I want you to see Jesus gives us options. What are our options? Listen very carefully. Your options are repent or perish. Now, if you think back to John the Baptist, John the Baptist was preaching, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus also is, is preaching, repent, repent or perish. Remember in John 3.16, perish is a word that Jesus uses. You would believe on him and not perish but have everlasting life. And so here, Jesus uses the word perish again, and it's one of the options. The twice-repeated question that our Lord asked in verse 3 and again in verse 5 reveals the inevitable calamity that comes into everyone's life. You may be living with calamity right now. Everything has just fallen apart all around you. This message is for you. These are the options that God gives us. Unless people repent. Now these are Jesus' words. If you have a red letter Bible, you unmistakably know who is speaking. It's Jesus. Unless people repent, when they die, they all likewise will perish. Hebrews 9.27 says, And inasmuch... As it is appointed for man to die once, and after this comes the judgment. You see, we will all stand before the Lord Jesus Christ. Most of the people in Jesus' day grew up in a works righteousness system. It was flawed. It was inaccurate. Because you cannot work your way into heaven in fact, it is impossible to put enough good days together to ever hope to make it to heaven. Heaven is by the grace of God. It is the free gift of God that you receive by faith when you come to Him and you repent of your sins. And when we ask ourselves, what are our options? It's repent or perish. We have to acknowledge the depravity of of our sin against the infinite holiness of God. And repentance allows us to affirm that Jesus Christ is the only way to God. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by Him. And repentance 
is not merely turning away from sin. That's the first step. It's running to God through Jesus Christ, who is the way, the truth, and the life. It's not only turning away from sin, it's choosing not to give in to sin, to no longer be a slave to those thought patterns, to those habitual lifestyles. So what are our options? Repent or perish? The second biblical truth that I want you to see is when will the next calamity come? It's in verses 4 and 5. Why does God allow good people to suffer? Good people suffer because of the natural acts, the natural acts of flawed people. And it brings calamity. It brings calamity into our lives. Just recently in our neighborhood, some cars have been broken into. And there'll be a two or three hundred dollar cost to get those windows replaced because they broke into those cars through usually a, a window, a locked car. And so calamity came to neighbors of mine as a result of the flawed society, the evil and the sin that's in our lives. Just a quick visit to any of our local hospitals and you see calamity as sickness befalls people. But a tower is referenced in our text, a tower that had fallen, and it was perhaps the construction of the Roman aqueduct where it fell and killed 18 people. It was a tragic calamity. And we realize that Jesus is specifically referencing this. In his declaration, Jesus said, we're not worse culprits than all men who lived in Jerusalem. He's saying they are not worse than others. Jesus remembers the extraordinary calamity that falls on men and women. He knows when there's difficulty. And his clear message is that this is not how Jesus punishes people. Not at all. There are ships, cruise ships, that are constructed that have severe flaws in their design and have problems. There are airplanes that are built and have recalls and they have to take those planes out of service. There are cars that drive themselves. I do not recommend you buy one. But they've had significant problems, those automatically driving cars. Just the thought of it makes me nervous, to be honest. But you see, the world that we live in there's mistakes constantly, and it brings consequences. There's sin, and it brings consequences. In Matthew chapter 7, enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide, and the way is broad that leads to destruction. That's the world we live in. And many are those who enter by it. And in verse 14 of Matthew chapter 7, for the gate is small, and the way is narrow that leads to life, and few are those who find it. You see, as genuine followers of Christ, we've chosen to live intentionally, to live carefully, that our lives would bring glory to God. The gospel of Jesus Christ is glad tidings, but it's only for those who leave the path of destruction, who leave the path of of unrighteousness, of evil, and choose repentance. That's a demonstration that you are a follower of Christ. Those who reject God's offer of eternal life are heading for destruction. They're on that path, that wide path of destruction. There's a third biblical truth that I want you to see this morning. What does Jesus expect from us? Jesus, what do you expect from me? And it really helps us to see why people suffer. People suffer because of their fruitful deeds, the fruitful deeds of unredeemed men and women. Jesus expects the urgent necessity of true repentance. And let me just say, it is a repentance that brings forth fruit in your life. 
Jesus expects you to bear fruit. The Lord expects every genuine follower of the Lord Jesus Christ to bear fruit. We typically are as spiritually mature as we choose to be, but spiritual maturity brings fruit in the believer's life. Make no mistake about it. Jesus expects every believer to be growing and producing fruit in their lives. In fact, in Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20, Jesus says, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Jesus knew that the crowds that followed him were headed for disaster. He knew they were headed for calamity because they were not following him unto salvation with genuine repentance. So Jesus tells a story, a parable, of a certain man who had a fig tree which had been planted in his vineyard. Now, here on the church campus, we have a fig tree. We had to remove half of it as we built a building a few years ago. But half of it still remains. And come August, in just a few months, there'll be delicious, ripe fruit. I invite you to pick some and enjoy it. It's uh, better than a Fig Newton cookie. It's very sweet and, and delicious. But in this parable, this certain fig tree didn't have figs. It did not produce fruit. And after seeing that the fig tree was not producing, the vineyard owner said, cut it down. Now, interesting that Jesus is telling this story. The vineyard owner says, cut it down. Now, why was Jesus telling this story? He was explaining what a mature believer is to be like. You're to be like a fig tree that produces fruit. Jesus expects his followers to turn away from sin, to grow into maturity, and to have fruit that is lasting and remaining. God patiently waits for you and for me to live in a manner that my life produces fruit, that your life produces fruit. And let me just tell you what the fruit is to look like. It's in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. It's the fruit of the Spirit, the fruit of God's Spirit. It's love and joy and peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh. That's what we war against. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and its desires. Remember, in this flesh dwells no good thing. And so we've crucified the flesh. We've crucified those fleshly desires, and it's fruit that remains, the fruit of the Spirit that Galatians 5 describes. And Jesus taught in verse 8 of our text that every individual who does not desire to be saved brings judgment upon himself. Oh, God would never send someone to hell. I've heard that just face to face. It's actually individuals who choose hell, who reject heaven. Remember, heaven is a free gift. It's by the grace of God, but you have to receive a gift. If I bring a gift and I, I offer it to Ryan, and he says, no, thank you, he's rejected my gift. It's the same with you. When God offers you a free gift and you reject it, then you choose not to receive God's free gift of eternal life with Him. 
You see, Jesus already said in verse 3 and verse 5, what are my options? He gave you two. Two options. Repent or perish. Those are the options. Repent or perish. And if you repent, then you're to grow into maturity so that your life produces fruit. That's what Jesus says. In fact, Isaiah 55, 6 says, Seek the Lord while He may be found. Call upon Him while He is near. Isn't that amazing? And in James chapter 4, verse 8, we read where if we draw near to God, He will draw near to us. Why do people suffer? Sometimes God allows us to suffer to remind us to obey Him because faithfulness and obedience is what God highly prizes. Why do people suffer here in this fallen world? Oftentimes, it's so that God can demonstrate His compassion and His kindness to you. In Genesis chapter 3, when sin came into the world, it was a game changer. We live in a fallen, sinful world. Those are the consequences that we live with. Why do people suffer? I believe God allows His children, you, to suffer. That you might comfort others. How could you ever identify with people who hurt if you've never been hurt? How could you ever connect with someone who's going through rejection if you've never been rejected by people that mean a lot to you? How could you ever weep with those who are weeping if you've never tasted the bitterness of tears, how could you do that? As we end this message today, we are greatly encouraged by what the great Apostle Paul writes, and we know. It's in Romans chapter 8. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love Him and called according to His purposes. God's called you. You're His child. You're growing in Christ. God's going to cause these things to work together for His good. Amen? Before we have communion together, I want us to worship the Lord and sing about Jesus, our Messiah. Jesus became sin. He had never sinned. He was our sinless Savior, our sinless Messiah. But He became sin so that we would have our sins forgiven. Worship the Lord with your hearts this morning. And then we'll have communion together.
is a social experience. Our joy, our pain, our hopes and dreams are all tied to our experiences with others. And there is one who truly understands. You see, salvation is not something, it is someone. And that one person took upon himself through time, pressure, trial, and pain, the very thing that separated humanity from God. Only by being man could Jesus die for humanity. And only by being fully God could his death be sufficient. His death becomes our death, so that his victory can be our victory. And he gave us communion to be together, to laugh together, to cry together and to be a continual reminder of this truth. We are united in his death as we are united in his life. I consider this a tremendous privilege to have communion with you. I'm in Matthew 26 where Jesus took some bread and this is unleavened, pierced, striped matzah bread to remind us of Jesus' body. And after a blessing, Jesus broke the bread and he took a cup and he gave it to all of his disciples. And it was to represent his body and his shed blood. And when Jesus gave this to him, he gave thanks to his Father. And he said in verse 27, drink from it, all of you. Now he had not been to the cross yet. He's instituting communion, what we would do in remembrance of his death. And that he's our soon and coming king. It's a memorial to remind us that Jesus is coming again. And then Jesus said, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is to be shed on behalf of many for forgiveness of sins. But I say unto you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's house. So what is Jesus saying? He is saying that this cup and this bread represents that I'm going to eat and drink with you in my Father's house. Isn't that amazing? 
that we're going to eat and drink with Jesus. This memorial is to remind us that he gave his life's blood and his body for you. Take, break, and eat the bread. Father, thank you for your body, which hung on the cross for those six hours. Not a bone was broken, but yet you gave up your life for us. Willingly, you yielded up your life for me. We give you thanks. Take that cup. Realize that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. So he shed his blood to pay the penalty for all your sins. What God was doing was looking at the sins of the world, past, present, and future. And he was looking at the death of his son, his only begotten Son, and realizing that this was the payment for the penalty of your sins. Take and drink together. Father, thank you for giving your only Son to pay the penalty for my sins and to wash me whiter than snow, and that I might live with you forever. I give you thanks for what you've done for me. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Now God allows bad things to happen to good people because it tests the sincerity and the genuineness of our faith. In 1 Peter chapter 1, we read, In this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials, that the proof of your faith being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. God allows bad things to happen to good people because it clearly teaches us not to depend upon our own resources, our own assets, but to depend wholly on God's divine resources. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 8, For we do not want you to be unaware, brethren, of our affliction, which came to us in Asia, that we were burdened excessively beyond our strength, so that we despaired even of life. Notice how discouraged the Apostle Paul is. Indeed, we had the sentence of death within ourselves in order that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God, who raises the dead, who delivered us from so great a peril, and will deliver us, he on whom we have set our hope, and he will yet Deliver us. God allows good people to suffer. His own children. Because it reminds us of his heavenly hope. Romans chapter 5 says, And not only this, but we glory, we exalt in tribulation. Knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance. And perseverance proven character, 
and proven character brings hope, and hope does not disappoint. Because the love of God has been poured out within our heart through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us when you receive Christ by faith, you receive God's Holy Spirit, His indwelling Holy Spirit. God allows good people to suffer because it teaches us to obey. Obedience and faithfulness is what God highly prizes. He treasures it when He sees you living in obedience. Psalm 119, verse 67, Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I obey thy word. And in verse 71, It is good for me that I was afflicted, that I may learn thy statutes. I realize that being disciplined is something that none of us enjoy. But God uses discipline in the believer's life to bring great gain. Hebrews chapter 12 says, My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor faint when you are reproved by Him. For those whom the Lord loves, He disciplines, and He scourges every son whom He receives. It is for discipline that you endure You and I, we are to endure. God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? But if you are without discipline, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate, illegitimate children and not sons. The good news is that Jesus has promised, I will never leave you nor forsake you. If you draw near to God, He's promised to draw near to you. And if God's eye is on the sparrow, the sparrow that falls to the ground, I know He watches over you. God bless you for living for Christ. What a joy it's been to participate together in communion, to worship the Lord, to sing His praises until we can come together as a church family and worship corporately, live boldly, live courageously, be a light in a dark world. Trust Christ. Amen? Amen. God bless you.